Before I get into my thoughts on Soul Hackers 2, I must thank Atlas West and Sega America for providing me with a free early copy to play. It's my first major review copy for a big game from one of my all-time favorite developers. So when I got accepted as one of the chosen few, I was very much a hyped man. I hope this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship between us, Atlas. Anyway, that being said, I always keep it 100% on my channel and give my honest, objective opinion on every game that I review. Soul Hackers 2 is a game that knows its audience, and most Shin Megami Tensei and Persona regulars will find themselves right at home here. With a familiar cast of demons to summon and a character-driven experience with dialogue lengthy enough to fill a short novel, there's over 70 hours of exploration including main and side content, which is a number I put together after my first playthrough entirely on hard mode, and there's still more demons that I've yet to summon. Soul Hackers 2 makes for a good offering if you're a returning fan of the Connected series or someone interested in trying your first turn-based RPG from Atlas, perhaps the king of such games. And yes, I really feel that way about Atlas's games, and I think most of the fans do too. For someone who hasn't tried an Atlas game, my suspicion is that they too are soon to be Atlas fans and just don't know it yet. First impressions from a developer mean a lot, and I'm so glad that I've seen some of the finest work that Atlas has done up to this point before playing Soul Hackers 2, because although there is a winning formula here, it isn't quite up to the standards that I have as a Persona fan. Maybe that's an unrealistic bar to reach for, but reviews are often relative, so it's a fair comparison to judge Soul Hackers 2 against the greatness of Atlas's finer work. What Soul Hackers 2 does do well, that a lot of fans and newcomers will appreciate, is that it takes cues from Persona 5 Strikers' streamlined approach to level design, story progression, and time management, features that tweak the infamous calendar system of the mainline Persona games to allow more freedom of exploration in a shorter format. I mention Persona 5 Strikers because it's clearly the model for how Soul Hackers 2 dungeons are built and managed and how the RPG mechanics play out. This concept is arguably more accessible to the average player and is likely the direction that future games in these series are headed. Each level can be revisited, but how replayable they are is another story. In Soul Hackers 2, you work at your own pace and there are no time-sensitive missions or tasks that you can be locked out of due to oversight or being too slow. Certain aspects of Persona games often feel rushed, but Soul Hackers 2 works around your schedule, though maybe that's because everything feels miniature by comparison to something like Persona 5, admittingly a massive undertaking for anyone who doesn't have 100 hours to free up. Like Persona 5 Strikers, Soul Hackers 2 is a much smaller game, not just in size, but in scope as well. Soul Hackers 2 still takes its time. And although most of the side activities yield results useful for customizing your party's build, there are still a fair amount of fetch quests that teeter on the edge of something out of a generic open world game. That's not to say that there aren't still interesting quests that lead to cool boss fights, or a few ever so slightly touching moments between the characters that you'll discover this way. But the intimacy of the narrative arcs, and the atmospheric quality of the world design that Atlas is usually known for is a bit off the mark here. You have a world in Soul Hackers 2 based in a pre-apocalyptic cyberpunk setting where robots flip pizza dough and super intelligent AI come to save the day by sucking your life's essence right out from under you. Well, I mean, it's not what it sounds like, but come on, it's an accurate depiction, as you can see. The point is, despite a charming soundtrack and a colorful looking overworld, the dungeons in Soul Hackers 2 are very mundane and samey, with some of the uninspired level design basically copy and pasted. For example, here's a section of the subway station, a main story setting taken from two different areas. 
They definitely did not take their time on this portion. Navigating the dungeons is relatively easy due to a lack of variety or puzzle solving, save for a few maze sections that are more of trial and error than intuition based. If you like this, you'll really like the Soul Matrix, full of random teleportations that seem to be solvable only by guess and check. The only real obstacles traversing them are the enemies that you have to sidestep in order to make any forward progress. This becomes a little annoying as they pop up every 5 seconds and unless you're in the mood for farming you'd rather not run into them. There are ways to limit exposure to them but there's nothing quite as useful as Ryuji's insta-kill feature from P5R. One thing I do think is decent is the ability to fast travel quickly in and out of certain areas and the use of summoning skills that makes navigating the dungeons less cumbersome. The game is so tiny as far as the number of locations that you don't lose much time by switching gears between checkpoints, and you can always leave a dungeon when you're low on MP, <laughs> and go right back in after resting at the safe house and having a meal. And this is one final point in the level design. The safe house was a great missed opportunity to have a cool nice. hub for your summoning squad, but there's no free roam at all here, making it less interactive than the shopping districts in the city which are just menu screens against backdrops. The music is pretty alright though, but certainly no LeBlanc. I think that Persona 5 Strikers also had lackluster level design, at least compared to its predecessor. But even P5S has cool dungeons that have their own themes and gimmicks that made them distinct. Soul Hackers 2 dungeons feel largely empty, with the only really memorable area coming right before the end of the game. And I think it's a bummer because part of setting the stage for epic turn-based fights requires, well, setting an epic stage. The Devil Summoners themselves are similarly not the most diverse group of protagonists, except for Ringo who really anchors the story by being warm and personable on her ion directive to save humanity from itself. It's a return to female main characters, led by a strong performance, at least in English, by Megan Harvey, the same actress that I admired so much as the adorable Sophia from Persona 5 Strikers. Weapons. Returning with her is the likewise talented Erica Lindbeck as Melody, a strange woman with a strange name who is all too stiff for most of the game, not unlike her gangland rival Arrow, who is much duller than his name suggests he would be. Ringo and her enthusiasm is one of the only aspects that makes the world of Soul Hackers 2 and its inhabitants seem worth saving. I will mention that I also thought Saizo's character was decent enough, and I do think the character models look nice, but overall they don't feel that animated to me. Victor over at the Demon Emporium was a character that I felt more intrigued in learning about than the summoners that I saved the world with. I'll make another video to talk about the lore in detail, but the story recalls a lot of the same plot twists and morals that have been used before to more dramatic effect in previous Atlas titles. What does exist here is interesting as an extended commentary on the increasing role of AI in our lives that seems to be more and more inexorable from how we derive meaning from our own existence. It is a story that isn't nearly as dark or mature as the games that came before it, and hence not as evocative or involving, but it's not without its good moments. Go. You don't have to have played Soul Hackers 1 or even any other Atlas games to understand it, but obvious Sounding cheeky references to Persona 5 were oh, obvious and a welcome. <laughs> I've saved the best part of the game for last, because what most people want in addition to an interesting story is interesting gameplay. And who oh boy, at least Soul Hackers 2 delivers a solid effort there. At first glance, it would seem that the core RPG mechanics of the turn-based model have been oversimplified here in Soul Hackers 2. The key word here, I think, is balance. It's true that some of the theatricality of Devil Summoning has been lost, for example, technically the entire game is a lie, because you never actually summon a demon in Soul Hackers 2. You merely harness their energy into your comp, gun, or melee weapon to strike the enemy down with, which does result in some cool animations, but you never get to see the demons you're using unless they're on the opposite side of the field. 
There's no dramatic, bloody, ripping off a mask from your face like an exorcism, or shooting yourself in the head to summon your persona. It's a letdown, considering they honestly did great with the designs themselves. Some of the demons are among the best designs that I've seen from Atlas, a company that designs demons better than anyone else out there. Anyway, the core mechanics of battling are actually relatively intricate and intuitive, especially if you've played into the system before. You've got the strengths and weaknesses, affinities and resistances, just like Persona or Pokemon. And like Pokemon, you've got to catch them all. Okay, look, even the game makes a pun at this, so of course I have to. By filling up the compendium, you gradually fuse monsters of greater style, power, and complexity. When you first start playing the game, you are limited to using only the specific demon you chose before battle, locking you into that particular playstyle. But as you progress and unlock a multitude of features that enhance your abilities, you can switch out whichever demons you have in your Rolodex once per turn. Building your stock of demons is actually quite strategic, because even the demons you have in reserves become useful due to the interesting passive mechanic called Sabbaths, inheritable skills that add a special tide-altering buff at random after stacking up hits against the enemy's collective weaknesses during a single attack turn. It's here that Soul Hackers 2 tweaks the popular baton pass mechanic from P5 adding a raw bonus attack power to the cumulative damage done to weaknesses along with other special modifiers you can enable and activate from the use of MP or RNG. I guess that technically this is when you get to see your demons in action in one grand all-out attack which converges on a group of enemies or condenses onto one specific target in order to eliminate them in a strategic manner. I like the way this mechanic is balanced rewarding you for your knowledge of affinities and party composition, as well as giving you a bit of RNG that makes the game interesting across both extremes of difficulty. The fewer enemies you have on the field, the more damage Sabbaths do in grand total, which makes micromanaging the boss encounters something to actually calculate. The number of moves each demon can learn is slightly limited, but there are plenty of character-specific buffs and unique attacks that add on to this, such as Melody's Mercy Kill when an enemy is at low health, which can save you having to endure an extra turn, or Saizo's nullification of attacks that could potentially wipe out the entire party. There are mystiques that can be earned by leveling up specific demons. These are items you can equip that enhance the power of your elemental attacks. This system is balanced in a way that prevents abuse by how you have to farm throughout the game for cash for upgrades, specific items that can be farmed from specific demons, and the fact that only certain upgrades are available for certain characters. So you cannot just stack up your deck to the very top. There are a lot of useful upgrades that I still haven't acquired, but the bottom line is Soul Hackers 2 does reward you for putting your time in to learn the mechanics and grinding in this system feels fair and rewarding. There's no real excess of resources at the end of the playthrough, but rather more to unlock still when carrying over items to New Game Plus. There are definitely combat features not included here, but overall, I enjoy the system and its inner workings, and for the most part, I felt that the turn-based combat was as tactical as I've seen in other games. There are plenty of main and side mission boss fights and even a few that are replayable with tweaks to their parameters for more challenging and unique gameplay possibilities. I played the entire game on hard mode all the way through, and while the game wasn't overbearing on this difficulty, it definitely had a degree of challenge and nuance that I think even the diehards can appreciate. I struggled with how I would score Soul Hackers 2, even up until the moment of penning my review, and I remain mixed. I was able to put in a good 75 hours to finish the main game and most optional activities with a few more things I need to do as a trophy hunter. There's definitely a strong foundation in the demon design and the turn-based mechanics, but in other essential areas of design, Soul Hackers 2 is lacking. I actually rather enjoyed my experience with Soul Hackers 2 for the most part, but I just can't help thinking that I've seen so much more from Atlas. And I think they know this themselves without having to do too much soul-searching. Because I hold Atlas to a greater standard, 
And because I know that Soul Hackers 2 could have been more ambitious, I'm going to be fair and give Soul Hackers 2 a 7 out of 10. I think Atlas has shown that they listen to feedback and they will improve upon this. In fact, one thing I want to give Atlas credit for is finally releasing a game with a simultaneous worldwide release. And for not including block scenes for recording, which would hurt someone like me who likes to record using the PlayStation 5 capture feature. Now, they just need to go back and remove the block scenes on the older games. They've been out for years. I would still recommend Soul Hackers 2 to fans who really enjoy turn-based combat and the demon mythology that Alice has cultivated, as well as the completionists who enjoy relatively carefree games that they can get trophies for. If you're new to this type of game, you might consider finding time to play it as well. But as a critic, whenever I think of how to pitch a game, I reflect back on if there's something else that someone should play instead. When I think of Soul Hackers 2, my mind takes me back to Persona. That's what Atlas is really capable of. Thanks for watching, and all in all, I'll still be planning on doing as much content as I see fit for Soul Hackers 2. So that stick around if you're interested in guides and more <laughs> for Soul Hackers 2.